Hello watch enthusiasts! Now in the world of wristwatches, and especially those who like luxury Swiss wristwatches, I think the, the, the term quartz is often seen as a derogatory term, and is generally uh, seen as something that was a problem for the Swiss watch industry, rather than something productive. However, today I'd like to talk about a watch which rose from this, uh, this period of, of upheaval, and in many ways produced a watch which is both incredibly rare um, these days by comparison to other watches produced by Rolex, but also something very different in terms of the way it was produced, and the fact that it lasted so long without changing. However, before I begin the video, I would of course like to encourage you all to join the Watch Guys, which is my group on Snups, which is a social media platform where you can share pictures of your collections and interests, and where you can discuss matters of horology with myself and indeed other enthusiasts, and where you can give me any video requests or questions you may have. And for today's featured picture from the group, we have Giant Racer's fantastic Rolex Oyster Perpetual Explorer. And of course, this is from the same family as the Oyster Quartz, which I'd like to talk about today. Now, in truth, the story of the Rolex Oyster Quartz begins far before its production in the 1950s. And in around 1950, Rolex began development of their own style of electrical movement. And this was a response to many things of that period, notably the end of the war um, and, uh, and, the, ver and the, the prosperity which began to grow in Europe, as well as the growing prosperity in America in the middle of the century, meant that uh, consumerism was growing, and um, purchases of watches um, as far as luxurious items was also going up. As a result, this, uh, this also followed on from the idea of the fact that in 1949, Bulliver released their, the first television watch advert, which was in fact the first television advert, which shows the growth of the watch industry during this period. And of course there is one element to consider, which is the fact that uh, during this time Rolex needed to find new ways of marketing, as this really was how the brand grew. The brand was developed by a businessman, not by a watchmaker, and this is really an element which was shown by this, uh, this development. It's also worth noting that during this period Rolex was very much of its time, and the reason I say this is because during this period, especially in 1952, we see uh, Elgin and, and Lip release first um, uh, details of their, their laboratory-run uh, models, which were designed to run in, in, in wristwatches as extremely accurate electrical movements, which still use an oscillator like a balance wheel in order to regulate the time. Now, Swiss involvement with regards to producing their own electrical movement was, uh, was expedited by the fact that Hamilton released, after over ten years of development in 1957, their first electrical movement which could, could actually be bought and sold. And this was seen in various forms in the Ventura, for example, being an extremely famous example of this watch, with this futuristic 1950s style of case and, um, and highly polished and, uh, and bright metal on these pieces. And these used a very traditional style of movement, um, apart from the fact they were electrical, they still used a lot of the components that were key to, the, to the, the function of a mechanical watch, and so were very far from the quartz movements that we would see today. And so in response to these pieces, the Swiss watch industry needs to find some sort of solution to this by producing a watch of their own, or a movement of their own rather, that could be used universally, that still kept them at the top of the, the world of, of horology and uh, kept them at the top of the quality of horology in terms of being the, the luxury manufacturer of the world. And whilst um, Switzerland hadn't always been the luxury manufacturer of the world, in fact far from that it was previously seen as a sort of a cut budget version of a French or a German watch, but that said, by this stage, they really were, were seen as the pinnacle of watchmaking, and were very keen to retain this title. Therefore, in 1962, the Centre Electronique Horloger was founded in Switzerland, and this was a body of roughly 20 Swiss brands which served the purpose of working together to create a single movement that would be able to, to run as a, a Swiss um, a adversary, if you will, to these, uh, these American and Japanese uh, innovations in the direction of producing electrical watches. And this group included some of the biggest players in the watch industry, um, from IWC um, through uh, Rolex, Omega, uh, we also see some Gérard Perregaux and Gigi Le Coutre, along with Piaget, in addition to Patek Philippe, who were all involved in this project, uh, among others in fact, in order to create this, uh, this movement, which would be capable of keeping extremely good time, and provide something very different to the Swiss watch industry, which still showed their craftsmanship and their care, but that didn't, uh, didn't require the mechanical movements um, and details that were so common and in fact were the, the only way around timekeeping of that period. In 1965 we see a major advance for this group because they decided at this point to use a, a quartz a style of, uh, of oscillator in the movement in order to be able to, to regulate it and, and keep time, which shows the first time they, they put down this, uh, this clear intent of using that style of, um, um, of timekeeping as opposed to uh, various types uh, um, of, of concept they'd come, with, uh, they'd come up with before because they dabbled with a figure of eight shaped resonator and a tuning fork, but ultimately it was the quartz crystal that, uh, that won the, the fight. The group's first successful movement was the Beta 1, and the Beta 1 was released in July 1967, 
and this was the first completely functional version of this movement, and was not for sale, but rather was one of their testbed models. And this uh, was, uh, was an extremely impressive leap in terms of accuracy from their previous mechanical movements, and, and did use that quartz, um, that quartz regulation. And it used a 14-stage frequency reduction chain in order to bring the frequency of the movement down to 0.5 Hz, so that's uh, one tick every two seconds. But this was then converted um, to power a motor, which would then uh, make the second hand tick once a second, as is the conventional way with a modern, uh, modern quartz movement. Interestingly, they did then move away from the beta 1 concept of having that ticking second hand, and in fact adjusted it somewhat, because this movement originally was extremely complicated, and even when it reached its production versions, it was still an immensely complicated movement by comparison to what we have today. We've highly simplified these movements, and this, uh, this was developed into the beta 2, and this was released with a, a simplified five-stage frequency reduction uh, setup, which meant that rather than having a, a ticking second hand, it had a smooth second hand, which would run around the dial um, as, a, as a similar sort of uh, concept to what we would see on a mechanical watch. Now, it could be said that the, uh, the 1970 release of Rolex's first quartz watch was accelerated by this, um, by this, this creation, and this was the Seiko Astron. This was the first quartz watch in the world, and showed that Seiko was at the forefront with, Jap with Japan of this electrical development. And this did certainly concern the, the, the Swiss watch industry because it offered such high accuracy um, in, uh, in comparison to, to conventional mechanical watches. And so as a result, in 1970, Rolex used what was now the Beta 21 movement to release its first quartz watch. In 1970, therefore, Rolex released the 5100, their first quartz watch. This piece featured a very modern style of integrated bracelet, which, uh, which fitted to the case and was available in either white gold, uh, which is the much more rare version, or indeed yellow gold. And only a thousand or so of these watches were actually produced, um, and, and they were a great success in terms of the numbers sold. They all sold, um, which is a, a very good sign, and certainly was a good sign for Rolex of the time. And due to the fact they used the Beta 21, which was the production version of all those developments with the Beta line in, in the 1960s, um, this watch featured the, the smooth sweep of the Beta 2, and also featured a, a five second a month accuracy, which was simply unbelievable by comparison to, to contemporary uh, mechanical timepieces. The design of this watch was also very, very different to their other timepieces, with a sort of a reverse integrated bracelet where it's the lug that juts out the centre, with the bracelet meeting it on either side. And the watch itself didn't feature the oyster style of case, but rather featured its own style with bevelled edges, polished and brushed areas, and, and of course that fluted bezel. The dial was left very clean in this sunburst sort of effect, in either the silver to match the, the white gold version, or a champagne colour to match the yellow gold 18 karat version. And so these watches sold um, out, out um, and there the thousand were produced, and it's incredible that only a thousand of these were made when you consider that Rolex produces 2,000 watches a day these days, which is an incredible change, and certainly does show the exclusivity of these timepieces. And due to how, how utterly unique this watch is in the Rolex range, this watch with its 13 jewel movement and 39mm case has become extremely popular in terms of vintage sales, um, and though they don't pop up for sale very often, Christie's auctioned one recently for over 30,000 Swiss francs, which does show just how, um, how popular these watches are, and especially how sought after the white gold models are. However, in 1972, Rolex made the decision to move away from the Beats 21 in favour of developing their own quartz movement. And this was a process that took five years and was finished in 1977, by which point um, the, the quartz crisis was very much underway in terms of being a period during which these, uh, these Swiss watch brands were really being decimated by the threat of inexpensive and very accurate quartz movements from Japan and indeed other nations that were producing them. And so as a result, during this time, Rolex was equipped with something to def defend its, uh, it, its, its position. Though I don't think that Rolex actually needed its own movement, for the simple reason that actually their mechanical watches were so well respected by this point that really they were seen as something very separate to, um, um, to these, uh, these quartz watches. And as a result, they weren't hit as, as significantly as other luxury brands were during this period. Whilst the inspiration of the movement certainly came from the Beats 21 and their work with that movement, the case design came from elsewhere. Because during the 70s, of course, there was this development of the integrated bracelet, and this was seen in the Rolex reference 1530 and 1630. And these were versions of the Oyster Perpetual date, and featured this, this squared-off sharpened case, which still featured the polished um, sides to the case and the brushed tops, but now flowed, flowed uh, continuously into the bracelet, which came in two variants. 
1530 featured a, uh, an oyster bracelet, whilst the 1630 was the two-tone version with a Jubilee style of bracelet, um, which, uh, which had a slightly different mounting point on the case as well, which meant that they weren't interchangeable, and as a, as a result they truly were um, proprietary bracelets, and they were completely integrated with the watch they were bought with. These featured uh, automatic movements from Rolex, and weren't related in that respect, but certainly paved the way in the very small numbers these were manufactured in for that, that oyster quartz to be produced. The fruit of Rolex's labour was seen in 1977, and this was the release of the 5035 and 5055 calibres. And these calibres um, were a date version for the 5035, and then a day date for the 5055. And these shed a great deal with the, the, the calibres 3035, which were movements which were released the same year, in fact, and were designed to unify the Rolex mechanical um, line as far as automatic perpetual movements went. And as a result of Rolex's interest in making the highest quality quartz movement possible, a lot of the, 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 the mechanisms were carried over um, very, very closely, in fact, um, from the, these movements to each other. The one significant development that can be seen in the production of this movement in its early years was only uh, a year and a half into production in mid-1978. These movements were changed um, to featuring a tuning fork-shaped quartz crystal and were now chronometer tested and cosc tested by Rolex themselves in order to be able to, to achieve a great accuracy. Prior to this, the movements which are sometimes referred to I've seen as Mark I movements didn't feature these, these two additions um, and, and as a result weren't chronometers as stated on the dials. What's immediately striking about this movement is its decoration. Throughout, this watch has the neat Geneva stripes and, and beautiful quality of finishing, which is un uncharacteristic for a quartz movement of this era, where a lot of the early electric movements featured a lot of exposed wiring and really were a mess. And here there was a movement that was extremely carefully put together um, by a watchmaker as opposed to an electrician. And this, this can be seen in the way that this watch isn't designed to show off its electrical aspects, as was the case with previous electrical movements, but rather was built in the same way as a mechanical watch would be. These movements were also pioneers of the world of thermoregulation, because these movements featured an integrated thermistor, and what this did was that it allowed the, the, the voltage going from the battery to the quartz crystal to, to be regulated and, and adjusted depending upon the temperature. And this meant that, uh, that the watch would remain extremely accurate, um, irrespective really of the manner in which uh, the temperature changed from extremes of heat to cold, this watch remained accurate. The accuracy of the watch was also increased yet further by the increase in beat rate by five times by relation to the Beats 21. And this wasn't seen though in the, the, the movement of the hands, because it didn't feature the, the flowing hands but rather a ticking method, and this is down to, to one other aspect of this watch. And that's that it didn't feature a direct drive system unlike a conventional quartz, but rather instead it featured a pallet fork and pallet wheel to which the, uh, the hands were directly attached and driven. And this allowed the hands to have no playback um, or, or indeed any, um, any deviation from the marks on the dial, as a result of having a, a, an, a, an escapement which locked the hands in position. And so these watches do give rather a bizarre demonstration if you take the case back off one of these timepieces, because you can see that little, uh, little escapement with its pallet fork um, bumping backwards and forwards once every second, which gives that beat rate to this watch, as opposed to the, um, the, the 8 times a second you would normally see in an automatic timepiece. The watch also featured a trimmer in its movement which allowed uh, Rolex to, to very accurately and carefully regulate the watch to be able to run within cost per, uh, parameters and settings during its, say, its, its production and its manufacturing. Now Rolex split production of this watch into two tiers. The first were the 17,000s, and the 17,000s were the Oyster Quartz Datejusts. So these simply had the date functionality on these, uh, these, um, the, these watches, along with a primarily stainless steel case um, with a variety of different bezels and, and bracelets. The dials also varied quite significantly, um, but all of these simply featured the, the date and, and not the day, as was the case with uh, the other version, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But the first of these variants was the 17,000, and this was the version with a stainless steel case, a polished stainless steel bezel, as well as a stainless steel uh, integrated oyster bracelet. And so as a result, this was probably the most robust of these watches, with the most sturdy of bracelets, and really the most versatile of these models. The next rank up the collection was the 17013, seen here in a uh, pre cosc 1978 configuration. And these watches were very similar in terms of case build, they retained the same finishing and the same design, but now where there had previously been one hole, um, one large slot cut into the case for the, uh, the bracelet to attach, now there were two very small ones. And this is because this version featured exclusively a, uh, a two-tone Jubilee bracelet which was integrated with the case. And the, the Jubilee bracelet was, was very simplified by comparison to their standard bracelets, but still retained that, that same style. 
It also featured an 18 karat gold bezel um, in this fluted finish, as well as an 18 karat gold crown, and thus followed the lines of the conventional Rolex design. This 36mm watch was also matched by its equivalent with white gold uh, configuration, and this version came as the reference 17014. And this still featured all the same features, except in the place of all this, the, uh, the, the the 18 karat yellow gold va uh, variant pieces, such as the, the, the bracelet mid-links, the crown, and the bezel. Now these were replaced by white gold for a more subtle and subdued look, while still retaining the heft and indeed the lustrous air of that gold. Moving into the 19,000 references, we see the day-date versions, and these cost in, in excess of four times the price of the conventional steel version, and are very, very different in terms of their build, yet do appear very similar at first glance. Firstly, of course, their cases come only in, in gold at this, in this period. There was no platinum option. They were purely gold. Um, and, and the first one, which is the 19018, is the, 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 the yellow gold case with fluted bezel, gold crown, and gold accents on the dial. These also exclusively came um, with the, the day-date style of, of bracelet in various um, detailings, because there is a particular version I'll talk about later on, which is completely unique. And the brushing on these watches was also very different, because in order to match the fact they'd actually polished the groove into the case, which was another di difference in detail um, on the bracelet of that, um, that President bracelet, we do see flattening of the links, as well as the fact the brushing is across the case in all, all positions, rather than being, uh, being uh, down the case and into the bracelet. And this brushing is seen mirrored on the bracelet as well, um, in order to give a, a very uh, unified appearance, and give the general appearance of luxury this watch was trying to give off. Likewise, this watch also saw the dropping of the drilled lug holes, and instead it had these little levers underneath the lugs, from which you could quite easily remove the bracelet. Continuing in the conventional Rolex nomenclature of having the 18 references being yellow gold and the 19 references being white gold, the, um, the, 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 the 19019 is the Oyster Quartz Day Date in 18 karat white gold, and it has the same specifications as the original yellow gold version, yet still cost more as a result of the material used. And finally, in terms of versions, there was the peculiar 19028. This was the Oyster Quartz Day Date in 18 karat yellow gold, except now it replaced the, um, the conventional style of President bracelet with a, a very similarly constructed bracelet, but this time it was a bracelet which was produced exclusively to be a pyramid bracelet. Now, the pyramid bracelet had a centre link with these sort of studded pieces of gold um, cut into it, and these matched the bezel. And personally, this, this aesthetic certainly doesn't appeal to me. I find it too fussy and somewhat too gaudy. But it's something utterly unique in terms of its look, with that integrated bracelet, which looks somewhat incongruous by comparison to the very old-fashioned and conservative Rolex dial. This watch is also differently designed to the conventional gold versions, because it's brushed um, laterally down the length of the bracelet, rather than horizontally, as is seen on the other two versions. This is also carried onto the case, which features this on the, the descent down to the bracelet, though they do still feature the, the, the circular brushing on the rest of the case. Now, production of this watch continued almost unchanged as a result of the fact that it was, it was created with sapphire crystal, and as a, a watch for the future, in, uh, in 2001. And production stopped this year, yet, uh, yet in truth they stopped selling them in about 2003, once they, they depleted their stock of these timepieces. And it does seem like quite an interesting run, because during this time only 25,000 of these watches were actually made, which suggests they really weren't particularly popular, as Rolex make 2,000 watches a day at the present time, to their thousand sales of these watches a year back then. And they did, did, they did try and push these watches as best they could in terms of advertising, with various advertising uh, pieces from Bushra, as well as the, the use of, uh, of expeditions. For example, they used the, 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 climbing, the first climbing of Mount Everest without oxygen in 1978 as a means of advertising these watches, um, as they were worn on the wrist of the climber, which is, of course, a, a return to the days of the original Rolex Explorer, or indeed a return to the days um, when, uh, uh, when the predecessors to the Rolex Explorer were, were being used extensively for exploration. Sadly, however, Rolex's efforts to produce this, uh, this watch as uh, the, the successor, if you will, to their, their mechanical watches, and as a, a genuine piece of luxury, um, luxury watch and horology. Sadly, these watches didn't, uh, didn't do as well as, for example, the Explorer 2 did in the 90s, or indeed uh, the GMT Master and the Submariner, all these sporting models, Yet it wasn't as, as formal and delicate and historical as a conventional date just, and so it simply didn't do well, um, and sales were always very low. And as a result, when this came to a, to an end, there wasn't any particular interest in producing a, a successor. However, Rolex themselves clearly had the ambition to do so, because they did have a project going on uh, alongside, which appears to suggest that they were looking to, to produce 
a, um, an updated and improved successor. This would have occurred around 2004, as various prototypes have been found which, uh, which for, from this period which featured calibers uh, 5335 as well as the 5355. And these were 23 dual movements which were entirely uh, crown-controlled perpetual calendars, which featured uh, both day-date and, and date complications in terms of display on the dial. But the idea, of course, of this is to increase the, the autonomy further of the idea that a quartz movement can simply be left to its own devices and keep time for long periods of time very accurately. And unfortunately nothing came of these, but uh, certainly this has left us with an interesting watch, a watch which is very different to anything else Rolex has made, and a unique watch. And the sad thing, I think, about these watches is that despite their movements um, being designed to, to be serviced throughout their lives, and to run really as long as any mechanical movement could run as well, uh, provided it was serviced uh, re regularly, these watches are now seen as, as uh, victims of the quartz concept, and in a way are victims of the very concept that they were trying to appeal to. And as a result, prices for these watches are generally low, with prices for steel models ranging around the £2,000 mark, um, up to about 8000 for a solid gold version on that, uh, that solid president bracelet. Which seems like a shame, really, considering the, the, the interest and the curiosity of such a, a different and, and wonderful little piece of, of horological history, which works so well with the idea that Rolex was trying to, to adhere to, to modern changes, yet in this case it simply didn't work. Anyway, I'll conclude the video here, but do leave your comments down below um, as to what you think of the Rolex Oyster Quartz, as it is an interesting debate to have as to whether it genuinely does have a place in horology, or if it's simply a, a dated piece of technology. And if you did enjoy the video, then please do like, share and subscribe to help the channel, and to be able to, to enjoy more content here in the future. So thank you very much for watching, this is Arm on the Watch Guy, out.